speakers, each an expert from a different background, and I'm confident that their insights will guide us forward. I'd like to thank them for taking the time to speak in today's session. Once again, thank you all for your participation, and I hope you enjoy today's dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Secretary General, for setting the context so eloquently. Uh, before we really move into the session, uh, I would like to request all our panelists to kindly open your camera. We will take a picture together so that we, we will put it up in our social media pages. I request my colleagues to kindly take the picture for us uh, so you can smile. Okay, thank you. I think uh, I'm, I think my colleagues have well captured our photograph. So before we, uh, let me just uh, try to set a context for this web dialogue. Um, in Bangkok, where I live and where our APT headquarters is based, uh, we have a constant challenges, especially the traffic and the air pollution. And recently we had a very erratic uh, weather patterns like excessive heat and abundance of rainfall causing massive floods across the country. And I think this is not uh, very unique only to Bangkok, but uh, it's the same story across all the major city across the country. So the simple question is how can we actually build a smart city, a society or community for that matter uh, that is quite efficient in delivering the public services and at the same time capable of uh, addressing all the challenges, especially related to urbanization, global pandemic, uh, environmental degradation, digital divides, gender equality, so on and so forth. So how can actually the government uh, regulators adapt to the conducive regulatory framework or how can the global organization such as ITU uh, define the interoperability and global standards, or how can the industry drive these uh, innovations? So to deep, to deep dive into some of these aspects, we have a very uh, four outstanding speakers, uh, each representing a key pillar of smart city ecosystem, the regulation, the international cooperation, and the industry. Uh, each speaker will be given 10 to 15 minutes, and then we will take uh, the Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, pin it down in our question and answer box. We will try to address them at the end. So to kick off our session, uh, I'm honored to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Shamsu Zoha from BTRC. Uh, he is currently serving as the Deputy Director at Bangladesh Telecommunication Regulatory Commission and spearheading various technical initiatives and wealth of experiences in telecommunication domain. He is the SDG and statistical focal point for BTRC and is actively involved in ITU, APT, ICANN, APNIC activities. He is also the current vice chair of ITU T Study Group 20 and the vice chair of uh, SATSC Working Group on Policy Regulation and Services. So, with this, I'll hand over uh, the floor to Dr. Zoha. Take the floor, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Nidu. Uh, can I share my screen? Just give us a moment. You want us to share the screen? Or? No, I think it yeah, is. Please. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hello and good afternoon from Dhaka and Good morning and good evening to my colleagues who are participating from different time zones. Uh, I'll not, not take much time in introducing myself. I think uh, Nidup said something about that. Um, so when you talk about smart city and society and we connect it with sustainable socioeconomic development, it's a very big topic. But uh, primarily I will focus on the uh, regulatory evaluation that is telling, uh, taking place around the world to support the innovation, inclusivity, and the sustainability. And 
mainly from the regulatory viewpoint. Uh, because I'm the first speak speaker, I will take the opportunity to ponder on the concept of smart city. Uh, those, I think most of the participants will know about it, but it's also important to look into the uh, evaluation of the concept of smart city as well. So in general, we see smart city as a uh, contemporary urban landscape the technologies are harnessed to improve public services uh, for the sake of standards of living and to promote sustainability. The concept mainly came from the academia back in 2000, one of the very famous uh, academia literature, they termed smart city as the urban center of future, made safe, secure, environmentally green and efficient because of all the structures are designed constructed and maintained, making use of advanced integrated materials, sensors, electronics, and networks, which are interfaced with computerized systems comprised of database tracking and decision-making systems. So it looks exaggerated now, but if we consider the, the context of 2000, I think it was a very a good capture of the close to real picture by academia. And then we see another definition by academia, a city that uses information ICT to make the critical infrastructure component or services of the city more ever interactive and efficient. Then another one in uh, 2017, the penetration of cities by ICT. So, you know, through the evolution of time, even the definition by the academia, by the researcher, it becomes more smarter. And ultimately, ITU, which is a like multi-stakeholder organization, so it defines uh, smart city as a Innovative city that uses information and communication technologies and other means to improve quality of life, the efficiency of urban operation and services, and competitiveness while ensuring that it meets the needs of present and future generation with respect to economic, social, environmental, as well as cultural aspects. So now we see that it's not only related to ICT and telecom, but we are talking about environment, we are talking about the society, we're talking about the cultures and we are talking about the overall livelihood of the people. So it is related to, it's not only related to a particular sector, but almost every sector is covered in the initiative of the smart city. And that's why the regulatory revolution is required in each sector and also to have interdisciplinary policy and regulation across the sectors. Uh, I think this is more, uh, clear from this picture, this is not an exclusive list, uh, just an example of different component of smart uh, city components. Uh, we have the transmor transformation component. Uh, we need the accessibility and digital inclusion. We need to reduce the environmental impact. There are energy or different type of utilities, uh, water management, emergency management, industrial issues, and not, but, uh, the, the the last one and definitely that is one of the most important part that is the sustainable city governance so it means the smart governance so all these components are related to traditionally different regulators and when you try to implement the smart city solution in any one of them or across the sector then definitely there is a requirement of transformation and evolution in the regulation itself and that is what we have been observing uh, across uh, all the years and definitely it is getting this now and if we look into the digital transformation elements and also in the life cycle of the smart city project it is also clear that through each of the step uh, of the life cycle or in the digital transformation we need the policy revolution as well not in a static sense but in a dynamic sense because the requirement is changing uh, the the scenario is changing. That's why we need to actually make our regulation regulatory framework flexible <clears throat> to adapt to the flexible needs. <clears throat> so why the regulatory revolution is relevant to uh, smart city development or smart city projects? We have talked about some of the issues, but more explicitly, first to ensure widespread high quality connectivity. Whatever be the initiative is mainly about data collection and transferring the data to a uh, analytical point. 
whatever we talk about in about any of the initiative so that's why the uh, the uh, network like either 5g or fiber optic network or low power wide area network those are es essential to support the dense connectivity requirement of smart city initiative and only a regulated framework can ensure the standardization and the performance expectation from those networks as well as to make the network reliable and accessible to all who are in need of such connectivity or solutions. The second is enabling IT and device interoperability. We have talked about different sectors. So when there are deployment of different solutions in different sectors, there is an issue of interoperability and common standards, and that can only be addressed and mandated by the regulatory intervention. The third is about building public trust and social acceptance. So whatever be the public initiative or the private initiative, we also need to take the citizen on board. And to take the citizen on board, definitely the trustable uh, public, as a trustable public face that I always term it as, the regulators, they should come forward and make sure that the citizens' welfare are always prioritized and all of their personal space, including their personal data is protected and used as it is uh, expected in the initiative of the smart city projects. The next one is to ensure the environmental and sustainability goals. Uh, regulatory framework can mandate the environmental standard for smart city infrastructure to promote sustainability in the development phases. And also, uh, the policy around the renewable energy was reduction on greenhouse infrastructure. It can help align the smart city projects with broader environmental objectives. Uh, and that is very important when we are talking about the sustainability issue. Because sustainability means uh, actually also to make our environment happy with our development goals. Supporting data security and privacy standard. Uh, connectivity in smart city involves constant data transfer, often containing sensitive or personal information. So the regulator must have to establish protocols for the secure data transmission uh, and the protection for those data through cybersecurity standard, encryption, and user concept practices. To facilitate investment and innovation, we know that the government itself cannot do all the initiatives. We need a lot of initiatives, uh, either through the public-private partnership or from the private sector. That's why to promote innovation and to draw investment, there should be a specific policy, especially for cross-sectoral initiatives and uh, to have them in a flexible manner so that uh, the operators or the researcher, they can experiment and deploy emerging technologies as a test bed and they can bring their solutions to the doorstep of the citizens. And uh, last but not the least, for the global and regional standardization. To make consistent regulation across all the regions, across all the cities, and even with international counterparts, we need to have mandated regulation from the regulators from different sectors, uh, in part with the international organization like ITU and ISO. So here, so far, I think it is quite clear that the regulatory intervention is very much required uh, in relation to the um, development of smart city projects and initiatives. And here we will see some example from different sectors that will make it more clear and how it is happening around the world. I think this is one a very good example from Qatar. In 2015, the Ministry of Information and Communication Technology, they uh, issued a policy to encourage open access and data sharing and they mandated that data should be managed as a strategic resources. I think it was a very con new concept in this part of the world by that time. Uh, and the data should support the policy and decision making. The second thing is that data collected or generated by each agency should not be viewed as belong to one agency alone, but is available for sharing with other agencies. And this is the made as a law. And lastly, data should not be duplicated it should be captured once and used for multiple general purposes. So that should be a common central uh, point of data aggregation and uses. At the same time, it's not only about uh, making the open access of the data. They are very 
keen in uh, issuing the data protection law as well in 2016 that individuals have the right to protect their personal data that is electronically processed and prior consent of individual users are required. So, you know, we are talking about energy, telecom, water transport, whatever be the sector, when you are collecting the data, we need to have a coherent policy that is uh, spread upon all the sectors for sharing, for uses, and for interaction of the system. So I think it is one of the best example of cross-sectoral policy that is affecting almost all the utility sector and public service sector in a country. The next example is uh, from Sao Paulo, Brazil. They have developed a communication protocol uh, by the city of uh, city government of Sao Paulo. And uh, interestingly, it must be adopted by any intelligent transportation system, closed circuit television system or traffic management system. So even from this, we see three different sectors. This is one is the uh, transportation sector, the other is the police or the public security sector, and the third is the traffic management sector. And this interdisciplinary or intersectoral policy was applicable to all of them. It brought all of them together and forced them to develop and adopt common standard so that the regulator can replace the public equipment with any provider without changing the given network. So it saved the cost as well. The economy came into play. On the other hand, the regulation could be improved public capacity to control urban mobility. So it can also be used in the public planning as well. At the same time, uh, the Brazilian data protection law enacted in 2018 turned mandatory the standardization of data and communication in actives in activities under public interest. So this is also a very good example that when you are mandating the use of data in a smart way, at the same time, you are also protecting the consumer. And if we look into the sector uh, that is related to this initiative, the transport authority, the city government, the telcos, the police, and the traffic. So that is how actually the regulation is also evolving in different sectors and coming together to make the, the solutions workable for the citizens. The next example is from Spain for uh, municipal waste management. The project was uh, to collect and analyze data from all types of sensors located throughout the recycling process and to help in decision making, to monitor the recycling process and using real time information, which enhances transparency for the citizen as well. So the citizen can also see the status of their locality, uh, of their particular area, and they can also take action based on that. So utility authority, city government, telco, environment, industry, everyone is related and they came together and they were actually revising their policy to add such type of framework as well. Next example is from Rio de Janeiro from Brazil. Uh, it's for monitoring. It's a very uh, innovative solution to monitor uh, the crime and to predict the crime behavior of different locality of Rio de Janeiro from a predictive model uh, from machine learning. So they also bring the researcher and the academia, they call it the crime radar. It was also featured in different publications. So the city government, the academia, the IT industry, the police and the telco, they came together to make the solution workable. And it really worked and changed the behavior for the public security department as well. Because uh, the police officers, they also need to follow particular protocol to report the crimes in such a way that it can be used as a pivotal data or information for future prediction and to adjust the resources and the uh, the capacity of the police department as well. Uh, the next two example is from Bangladesh, the digital centers. Uh, we have uh, more than 9,000 digital centers across the country and uh, it involves more than 16,000 digital center entrepreneurs. So it's a one-stop solution that ensures that the underserved especially the women or the people with disability or anyone, they can come to the center and get any of the private and public services uh, uh, from those centers. And this one-stop shop does represent a novel public-private partnership model. The go uh, government is not paying those entrepreneurs, but they are collecting the money from the private services, but they're cost subsidizing those to offer free public services as well. And it is offering more than 300 and 87 public and private services from a single point. So it really, I am also showing some uh, uh, some statistics here that shows the impact. 
So the central government, the local government institutions, the telco, the private entrepreneurs, the SME, they came together to make the model a success and it's really working. Uh, so, and it's also affecting the overall regulatory processes of all the different sectors and offices of the government department to make it happen. And uh, the last uh, case study that represents the Inothi system, that almost all the offices of Bangladesh, those are now paperless. So this is a uh, digital filing system. We do everything of the office work that has been traditionally done in paper files in online. And more than 11,000 offices are connected. And it is really changing the efficiency of the government procedure and also for the private sector as well. For example, uh, the customs is also using the same platform. So getting the NOC or custom clearance become very easy for the entrepreneurs. So the citizens can supply, uh, apply through the online portal, national portal. So they are also directly benefited, saving a lot of time and cost for them for traveling uh, and the man hour. Uh, and that's why it is also adopted in the government, uh, the, the policy that is called the, uh, the policy of uh, disseminating government services. It is officially adopted in different uh, layer of the government. So it really made a real change in the government procedure. And there is a lot of regulatory evolution to make it happen at different layer of the government. I think we have a, a colleague from ITU. He will talk about more on this initiative, United for Social Sustainable, Smart Sustainable City Initiative. But I just want to focus that even through this initiative, because they have a set of KPI of 91 indicators and the interested city who are subscribing to this initiative they are actually uh, having a stock taking of, of their of their position and they are getting a suggestion from the i2 expert and based on that they are adapting and if having a transformation in their regulatory framework uh, to achieve the goal for smart and sustainable city so it is really also making an impact in changing the regulatory framework in different countries Having said that, I think my time is also up. Uh, thank you, and I will be happy to answer any of the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zoha, for a very compelling presentation on how the regulatory frameworks are adapting to support the innovation, inclusivity, and long-term sustainability of the smart city projects. And when you talk about any new uh, initiatives, uh, such as smart city, uh, projects, the foundation always lies in the regulatory framework that actually enables such transformation. Uh, now let us turn to the next speaker and let us hear another uh, regulatory perspective. Our next speaker is Mr. Abdul Kayum. He is an advisor at the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India and a distinguished officer of the Indian Telecom Service. He currently serves as the chair of SATSC Spectrum Group and vice chair of ITU Study Group 12. Uh, he comes with a wealth of experience in developing standards in emerging areas such as 6G technologies, quantum communication, next generation passive optical networks, and sustainable telecommunications. Uh, I hand over the floor to Mr. Kayum. Please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nidu. <clears throat> So, are my slides are visible? Uh, not yet. Okay. How about now? Uh, yes, uh, you can go ahead. Thank you. So, thank you very much for nice introduction. Um, COVID-19 has actually shown the vulnerability of human feelings and uh, it forced us to rethink, recalibrate uh, the ICT infrastructure that we have laid so uh, my previous sp speaker, Dr. Joe, has very clearly outlined the requirement 
for ICT, uh, for smart city, to make it smart. So I will be discussing some of the regulatory actions that we took at uh, in India at Telecom Regulatory Authority. I will be discussing those parts. So, so I will be covering my uh, topic under spaces for infrastructure augmentation, liberalized resource management, <coughs> sorry, promoting inclusivity and equitable access, and finally sustainability. So uh, 5G deployment started and uh, that preceded COVID-19 uh, and uh, it make her realize that how important is the ICT infrastructure. So we are very uh, clear uh, that uh, if you want to provide support to the people, it is important that we should have a very good infrastructure laid, which is, which is resilient in different weather conditions, in during the floods, during summers when the heat is too much. So considering all those challenges, uh, we uh, focused that how we can enable industries to uh, make the deployment quick. So one of the problem that industry raised was right of way, getting right of permission from the municipalities was very difficult and sometimes it used to take months to year for getting uh, permission for laying cables or erecting towers or uh, getting electricity connections. So in this regard, um, we uh, had four or five uh, POCs, proof of concept, we covered airports, we covered ports, we covered uh, common places to bring out a policy which reduces uh, the expenditure of deployment, which increases the reuse of uh, what is infrastructure that, that are already available. So the first thing we did that we uh, made request online any service provider who want write up a permission from any municipality or government they need they need not to go to any uh, particular body they can apply online and they will be getting online permission if the permission is not given in 30 days automatically in 60 days they will be deemed approved so it solved uh, many of uh, the issue that uh, service providers are facing then there was a request from the industry that can we use the street furniture that are available like poles, bus shelters and all that. In this regard, uh, we discussed uh, with the uh, agency who were owning those infrastructure, for example, power utility companies, transport uh, companies, those who are having bus shelters. And, uh, uh, in particularly in India, we have number of agency which owns the part of infrastructure in different part of the city. So there are many and we discussed how oh, that can be done in a coherent manner. And all those uh, things, we made a recommendation uh, for use of street furnitures. And we also requested, <laughs> recommended to the government that here onward, if there is any road construction, along with the road, there should be a common duct where along with the other utility, uh, there is a, a space for laying optical fiber cables. We also allowed sharing of passive and uh, active elements. So in a way, through this, we enabled uh, reduction, you know, uh, of the number of elements that used to be there by having uh, just a common uh, active or passive elements. Uh, similarly, these uh, 
service provider facing the different states where uh, you know uh, putting property tax on towers and the cables that they have laid so there also we uh, came with a recommendation that there should uh, there should not be any property tax on these prop on these properties and uh, and the uh, operator is also facing to enter into the government buildings uh, and use property that that were developed by um, private um, so we made a recommendation uh, to the urban ministry and they have included uh, ICT along with the electricity as a common service and now henceforth any building uh, layout approval will have necessarily place for ICT equipment. So, so I, uh, you might have noticed that India is, uh, is the fastest country to deploy 5G in a very short uh, period of time. We are the second in the world and that actually came through uh, making a spectrum adequate spectrum available. Also, we allowed sharing of the spectrum, uh, which increased the efficiency uh, and availability of the spectrum. Then there were requirements for uh, testing of the frequency that were not allotted to any operator uh, for new cases. So, mm, uh, through that regulatory sand, uh, sandbox concept we introduced and now any operator which want to introduce any new service, they need not to take uh, any uh, formal uh, no, approval from the government, they can do it and they only need to inform the uh, agency that they are going to make a uh, test with the certain uh, frequency. And, uh, <clears throat> Then as my previous uh, speaker discussed about uh, IoT and M2M, we were uh, having representation from the uh, industry that there are uh, issues with interoperability. Different manufacturers were coming with uh, log devices and uh, suppose at one point of time, one smart city has uh, purchase equipment from one vendor and in subsequent tenders if they are buying from another vendor there used to be a problem and there was no interoperability so there also we came with a regulation now this interoperability uh, issue has been solved we also uh, we also have regulated uh, service providers uh, they are offering iot or m 2 m services then uh, we have also uh, dedicated a spectrum to the uh, railway because when traveling uh, there were spots where there was no coverage so we thought that we can have uh, spectrum dedicated for the railway which they can use for providing service to the inside the train itself so another problem that is service provider are facing that uh, they we are not getting any uh, um, for example, um, if some service provider is interested to provide in-building solution, so they were not able to purchase or import the equipments. So to uh, solve those problems, we came with a new concept of authorization uh, where uh, service providers can provide both active and passive infrastructure to authorize service providers. In this case, uh, just having a uh, DCIP license, uh, you can import the equipment that have some relation with the frequency. So, 
in the while discussing uh, sharing of infrastructure we have mapped all the infrastructure that is available in india and any agency who is to put their industry they can view that what what kind of service that is available at that particular place and they can also put their requirements so that and then that requirement is visible uh, to the service provider and if the services are not available particular location they can directly communicate with the industry and they can set up there mm. also uh, overall in this process our focus was to reduce wastage and increase the efficiency and uh, and through that uh, we try to make some contribution uh, in to avoid climate change so that is all from me thank you very much uh, thank you mr karyam for very interesting perspective uh, you have touched upon several elements like including the challenges that try as a regulator has dealt with and also how you are collaborating with industry to make this uh, smart city initiatives possible and especially uh, it was interesting to note that how you are uh, trying to make uh, the adequate spectrum for enabling the overall digital transformation. Now, uh, as we explore how these regulatory frameworks are paving uh, for the smart cities, uh, it's crucial to see how this uh, effort connects to the global standards. Uh, with that in mind, let us now turn to our third speaker. Uh, he is uh, Mr. Chen Sub Lee, uh, who is the director of the Intelligent Convergence Research Laboratory. He joined uh, Electronics Research Institute in 1999. Currently, he's also serving as a rapporteur for the question one of ITU study uh, group 20, which is covering the interoperability and interworking of IoT and smart cities and community applications and services. He's also uh, editor of the IoT and Smart City and Community Standards Roadmap, maintained by JS, JCA, IoT, and SCMC. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Lee. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the nice introductions. Okay, uh, first of all, let me share my screen. I guess it's okay, right? Uh, yes, uh, it's okay. Okay, okay uh, thank you for inviting me to introduce something from ITUT. So today I will be discussing ITUT activities on smart cities, uh, particularly how the ITU helps in building smart cities. So as introduced, I'm the rapporteur of question 120 which is the mainly dealing with the interoperability of IoT and smart city platform in various verticals in the city. So today, uh, I'm gonna talk about the ITUT activities in six points. The, the first one is the standardization activity in ITU, basically the study of training activities. And then I will uh, introduce digital transformation dialogue, which is the uh, kind of webinar, which is a similar what we have now in here. And then I will also introduce the U4SEC activities and also KPI from U4SEC. And then uh, I will uh, briefly introduce the toolkit the ITOT provide for the uh, digital transformations for the cities. And also I will uh, briefly introduce the collaboration with the other SDOs and uh, industry fora uh, of ITOT, ITU, okay? Uh, basically, the IoT and smart city related standardization activities is undertaken by study group 20. Study group 20 is the main uh, main study group, which dealing with the IoT and smart city and communities. As you know, there's a, a 11 study group in this study period in ITUT, and study group 20 is dedicated group for the IoT and smart city. At the beginning, uh, 
title of Sorgup 20 was IoT and its applications, including smart cities and community. That means at the time we consider that smart city is the kind of the part, uh, just one of the application of IoT, IoT application and services. But in the second uh, study period, which is started from 2000, 2017, it changes the title to IoT and smart city and community. So at the, from that time, uh, ITU consider that the smart city is one of the uh, important area, uh, which is the almost the equivalent to the IoT uh, or more than the IoT. So uh, for the time being, in study group twenty, there's uh, almost one hundred recommendation which is dealing uh, with the smart city things in various vertical from the water management to the uh, city management or the smart port or smart airport or uh, so many things like a street light in the city. There's so many uh, recommendation, which is the international standards are available from Stargo 20. And then uh, also in this uh, in these days, Stargo 20 extended its, uh, the, the work area to the digital twins and also metaverse. Now we are talking about cityverse, which is the uh, basically uh, better for the smart city community. So for the next study period, uh, study 20 will fo more focus on the digital twins and metaverse technology for the cities. And for your information, uh, next study 20 meeting will be take place in on 15th to 24th January next year in Geneva, Switzerland. So you can join that. And as you know, in until last week, we had WTSA, the assembly in New Delhi, India. But, and in, in that WTS24, we have two important uh, results, which is related to Sorgup 20. The first one is the uh, revision of WTSA Resolution 98, which is the uh, basic uh, resolution uh, for the Sorgup 20. So in the in the revision of nine, Resolution 98, uh, three uh, key points are added. The first one is the why that 4600 recommendation is referenced which is titled Requirement and Capabilities of Digital Twin System for Smart City. That means uh, Story 20 will more focus on digital twin for the city. And then the other one is the WIDA 4903 is referenced. That's the key performance indicators for the city. So I will uh, talk about uh, this recommendation and activities more in the later slide. And we, uh, also, Story 20 is instructed, instructed to study on digital twins and cityverse. As I mentioned, the cityverse is the metaverse for the smart city and communities. And for the time being, there is no clear definition of cityverse, but uh, uh, for the time being, we uh, assume that the cityverse is a kind of metaverse, uh, cityverse is a metaverse for the smart city. So uh, as instructed by WTSA from next study period, Study group 20 will more focus on cityverse and digital twin things. And also there is a, a, another revision of resolution, which is resolution two, is called uh, contain all the mandate and point of guidance of all the study groups. And in there also study group uh, mandate and the point of guidance for study group 20 was included. And also in resolution two revision, we have digital twin and metaverse now. So from the next study period, so the group 20 will more focus on digital twin and metaverse things and cityverse. And next one is the digital transformation dialogue. So ITU provide digital transformation dialogue uh, from time to time. Until now, we have more than 50 uh, web webinar already uh, uh, provided. And this is the uh, something uh, some, uh, similar what we have now. So this is basically invite experts and have some uh, the, the view, uh, have the share the view on the smart city and especially digital digital transformations. And uh, next session for this digital transformation dialogue is ask expert session. So we will invite some uh, experts on smart submarine cables. So that will be held in fifth uh, of November. So if you have you have interest, then you can join that. And also, if you go to the uh, the website shown in here, you can uh. uh Look at all the uh, past event, so you can uh, have uh, YouTube, YouTube, and everything in there, so you can uh, you can uh, utilize that. And next one is the United for Smart Sustainable Cities, so U four SSC. It's a uh, global UN initiative that supports cities, and 
in U4 SSD, they are uh, they uh, uh, make some uh, progress through the uh, semantic groups, which is developing the action plans and guidelines and key performance indicator project and also on uh, uh, the key performance indicators project, uh, which is evaluating city's roles, ICT's roles, and provide the tools for uh, assessment of the DO progress. So there's an ongoing uh, symmetric groups like here. So city platform, from city platform to artificial intelligence in cities, or digital well-being, uh, digital, pub uh, digital public infrastructure for city, something like uh, those uh, symmetric group is under working. So they are developing a uh, guideline for that. And there's a uh, eight uh, symmetric group also already concluded with your report. So if, if you go to the ITUT website, then you can uh, find all the deliverables from the, those uh, symmetric groups. If you download that, there's a, uh, there's information that the, uh, the problem the current city is facing. And also there is uh, some solution over the relevant international standard or UN resources can be utilized to uh, solve that uh, the issues facing something like uh, some some that kind of information are included in those uh, deliverables so you can uh, to utilize it. And then next one is a KPI, the key performance indicators. So UFSS KPI is uh, implemented in over two hundred cities worldwide. So if you apply that, uh, you can get the report and benchmark or a map. So in the report, uh, they have some analysis on the key area for the, uh, and also there are some uh, important lessons learned, and also they uh, provide some actions for improve the cities. And also in the benchmark report, they, uh, they you can, uh, the cities can track the, the over, over, over year, the process progress, and they can, uh, you know, compare that the, in the past and now, and what kind of progress they made, and what uh, effort should be uh, given, uh, should uh, should do, uh, give more effort on on in, on which area. And finally, the map uh, we call it the snapshot. So provide a powerful visual representation of the area where city action is required. So if you look at here, the green one is they are doing well, and that green one is that they are a little bit lower than the average. So uh, with this snapshot map then city can uh, identify which area they have to, you know, put more effort and put more budget on, you know, improving the uh, something in the city. So this is the KPI project. And also ITU provides on toolkit on uh, digital transformations. So basically this toolkit uh, is a one-stop guide uh, containing latest international standard and other ITO and UN resources that can be utilized, you know, for digital transformation. And also they identify uh, all the challenges faced by cities and also they uh, provide possible solution, potential solution uh, they can, uh, you know, leverage for maximum positive impact. Also, they have a comprehensive uh, in, a collation of information that uh, is meant to inspire and support progress toward the uh, you know, SDG, especially SDG 11, which is the Smart Sustainable Cities. And this toolkit has, uh, has currently we have uh, 12 modules for this toolkit, the, from the digital transformation of city and community to the digital agriculture. So if you uh, go there, you can find some of uh, the modules and in, in that module, you can also find the all the uh, resource, resources can be utilized to you know for the trans, uh, digital transformations. And also, ITU tried to strengthen the collaboration with the other SDOs and industry fora. So uh, they are uh, uh, under Circle Twenty. We have joint coordination activity on IoT and smart city and community. Uh, this is basically this is the platform to you know share information between the uh, all the study group in ITUT, but also the with the other SDOs. So every JCA meeting, we uh, have appointed the focal point from other uh, SDOs and all the study groups, and they uh, provide their uh, progress on uh, relevant activities. So we can uh, share the information, how uh, they make progress and what uh, what is going on out there. And furthermore, we are trying to coordinate the activities uh, between uh, uh, study groups and other SDUs. And last one is the uh, joint smart task force. So 
in year 2019, IEC, ISO, and ITU uh, jointly established the joint task force on Smart City. So this is the collaboration uh, coordination mechanism between three SDUs, specifically IEC Systems Committee on Smart City and ISO TC268, which is the Smart Social Series, and ITU T720. So uh, this joint joint task force, uh, you know, try to uh, uh, gather all the stakeholders in the same place and try to identify the, the standardization demand and requirements, and also. Uh, uh, they are, uh, you know, they uh, prepares. Uh, they develop some kind of uh, roadmap for the uh, smart city standardization. So this is the uh, uh, what the ITU can uh, ITU uh, provide for the city for the uh, digital transformation of the city. I think this is the uh, all my presentation. I'm ready for answer any question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for very illuminating insights. And we have heard about how ITU as an international organization is really playing a critical role in setting the global standards. And indeed, it was from your presentation, very interesting to note that concepts like uh, digital twin and cityverse are now part of the study group 20. And because I believe these are really a game changer, especially when you try to understand how cities spot cities should be designed or how sh they should be a uh, function. Uh, building on these perspectives, uh, industry leadership is equally, I think, vital to make these visions a reality. So we have our next speaker, Mr. Ashish from GSMA, um, who will actually uh, take us through how mobile industry players are driving the development of a smart city mm -hmm. ecosystem. Mr. Ashish is uh, the senior manager from for the spectrum and policy in the South Asia at the GSMA. Uh, with a rich background in ICT sector, he has held key roles at Reliance, Etisalat, Samsung Networks, Telecom Infrastructure Associations. He has also led uh, various projects across uh, digital infrastructure development broadband expansion, sectoral taxation, and emerging technologies like IoT. He also worked very closely with governments on various regulatory initiatives and policy contribution to the region's digital environment. So Mr. Ashish, please take us through. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Nidup. Uh, I hope uh, you, okay. Thank you for this. And uh, before going ahead, first of all, I would like to thank the APT for arranging this web dialogue on smart cities and solution. And uh, thankfully, and we appreciate that we are not discussing or our discussions today are not limited to smart cities. We are also focusing actually on sustainable smart cities or we can say smart sustainable cities. So I'm going to present on behalf of the industry and uh, how uh, the operators are focusing on uh, smart uh, uh, city uh, solutions and what is the operator's uh, role in the development and enablement of these smart cities. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. For those who are all uh, who are not aware about GSMA, GSMA is a global organization having more than 1200 members globally and out of those more than 800 are the mobile operators across the world. So digital utilities program at GSMA, uh, they do a lot of interesting things. And one of their work is also in area of smart cities and smart urban living for which they also, uh, uh, you know, work very closely with uh, various stakeholders in the ecosystem. Digital utilities program at GSMA, uh, you know, they uh, actually bridges uh, mobile technology and development goals by digital innovation in urban utilities like water, energy, sanitation, transport, and many others. We also believe that smart cities are not only about the urban utilities or uh, the uh, or uh, about technology, but also about resilience. By resilience, we mean that making uh, the solutions uh, uh, future proof so that they are able to sustain with ongoing changes like change in population uh, and climate changes, which also leads to a lot of inequalities in the society. Can we go to the next slide? 
Yeah, and how uh, GSMA uh, role is important here. We are driving digital innovation to improve utility services. And as a next step, uh, also supporting uh, uh, urban resilience, as I have explained, by uh, enabling essential services via mobile technology. We also support uh, various organizations with funding, research, and also advisory support. So these are those organizations, especially the innovators who are involved in actual deployment of a solution in a smart city ecosystem. Next. Yeah, so uh, the uh, uh, when I represent industry, you know, uh, I would also like to uh, emphasize on why should mobile operators think about smart cities and their enablement. Uh, this is not their core domain, right? So uh, there is a reason for it, uh, growing urbanization and uh, uh, if you uh, look at the details, around 50% of the population lives in urban cities uh, uh, at present, uh, currently. And as per the estimates, two-thirds of the global population uh, will live in cities by 2050, which means additional 16%. Uh, so at this additional 16% comprise of, uh, you know, almost 2 billion more people in Asia and Africa uh, itself, uh, uh, who will start living in urban areas by 2050. Providing utility solution is one thing, but as we discussed earlier, resilience, resiliency is another aspect that needs to be tackled. And this rapid growth, uh, you know, 2 bil billion more people in just Asia and Af Africa is going to create challenge challenges in delivering uh, these solutions and uh, uh, solutions like uh, solutions for energy, water, uh, and waste management services. The infrastructure or the solution that we create today will may not be sufficient uh, tomorrow or uh, to uh, be able to sustain uh, with the growing uh, uh, people uh, in the urban areas. So for operators, uh, you know, this, uh, this much potential is going to be there. It offers a huge opportunity to diversify by becoming uh, not uh, uh, from a, uh, to change their role from just a connectivity provider to a, a you know, entire a digital service provider in the urban services ecosystem. Next, please. Yeah, so these are some of the roles uh, that we uh, envisage for the mobile operators. They can play a different role in a smart city solution, uh, just a connectivity provider, then they can go beyond that. They can uh, become a, a solution provider, or B2B enterprise solution provider, managing end-to-end -end, uh, operation and maintenance of the uh, solution. And also a solution provider means developing a smart city solution itself and offer to the customers from the, uh, who can be a government agency, can be a utility company as well. So these are some of the roles that we expect mobile operators can uh, play going forward in the, uh, in the smart city uh, domain. Yeah, uh, and how digital solutions improve urban service delivery? Digital tools like smart meters, IoT, mobile payment, and also the GIS and uh, data analytics have the potential to address major service gaps, be it affordability, be it efficiency, uh, or uh, connectivity, planning, safety, or security. So, uh, uh, so uh, we play a very important role. If, if we talk about affordability, you know we. Uh, enable pay as you go model, uh, which ensures access to services for low uh, uh, low income households. If you talk about efficiency, then also IoT allows real time monitoring and automation and helps utility providers manage operations effectively. Then uh, data driven insights, uh, which GIS and and uh, the uh, the emerging technologies like big data data provides. Uh, and provide valuable information for governments, utility agencies to optimize urban services like transportation, energy, uh, and waste management. For instance, you know, smart meters. Uh, let's take an example of smart meter. Uh, they, it can help utilities detect issues like power outages immediately and enable faster response time and better service delivery. Yeah, can we go to the next? Uh, yes, so it is uh, now let's understand the role of each st stakeholder, how it works and with the help of a case study from Sri Lanka, where GSM is also involved very deeply. Uh, Dialogue Exiata, which is a mobile operator in Sri Lanka, it has partnered with Leco, which is Lankan uh, electricity company. Uh, to introduce a smart metering with support from GSM innovation fund. Uh, the project was started in 2012. 
and currently the project tracks data from 3200 smart meters and also uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, network monitoring devices to help uh, identify grid issues uh, very quickly and as a result what what has happened uh, the fully integrated uh, prepared electricity metering was launched and further scaled up uh, giving customers flexible payment options and for electricity company also it has resulted in improvement in revenue collections so this shows how mobile operators by engaging in smart solutions can drive innovation and also enhance urban services in partnership with utility providers. So GSMA, uh, so, so, so in this area, GSMA is doing a lot of work and recently it has initiated similar discussion in India. Uh, as well with key stakeholders from government industry and solution providers and a lot of innovators. The key outcome that has come out of the discussion uh, which has taken place uh, uh, very recently is that collaboration is essential, right? Government, mobile operator, utility providers, they must work together to overcome challenges like interoperability, previous speakers, especially from regulators, they have talked about the issues uh, involving interoperability and also policy alignment. So smart city needs is need a standardized framework so that digital solutions can function seamlessly across networks, across regions and across industries. And in the coming months, we are also trying to take the discussions further in India. Probably we'll have more details on this initiative uh, uh, sometime later. Next one. Yeah, for me as a uh, you know representative of the industry, this is slide is uh, uh, important talking about the enabling factors uh, and the acknowledgement or the recognition of at least two factors. So we have the privilege of having the regulators uh, in this uh, uh, dialogue or in this call. Uh, we would like them to acknowledge or recognize two facts. First is that the mobile operators are an essential partner in smart cities uh, development. And also second is digital tools like IoT, Mobile payment improvement, uh, uh, they improve efficiency, affordability, and accessibility. And that's why GSMA encourages collaborative approach and requests stakeholders to take cognizance of this. The next one. Yeah, so uh, this is probably the last slide and uh, I would like to make everyone aware that GSMA is uh, uh, has initiated uh, further a study or a, a research on how mobile operators can enhance their role in the smart city agenda. And the study of the research is focused on uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia and Southeast Asia region, wherein uh, we will be uh, assessing the uh, mobile operator's role in the smart city solution and also how can they change their positioning from just a connectivity provider to a you know end to end solution provider and uh, 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 the contact details from my uh, of my colleague who is uh, uh, you know uh, leading this project uh, are mentioned here uh, but uh, anybody can reach out to me as well so that i can connect them uh, with uh, the uh, concern team so and and we invite regulators and industry people to uh, to take participate in the uh, project because once we have views of all these stakeholder input from all stakeholder then probably the research or the study will have uh, better uh, anticipated outcomes yeah th thank you so much and I, I am happy to take any questions now later on thank you very much uh, mr ashish from gsma i think that was very inspiring perspective especially on the role of how mobile operators are playing as a smart city enabler and you have also touched up on several points such as uh, scaling through collaborations and building urban resilient digitally so the bottom line is i think if the economy uh, should uh, thrive i think it's the industry that should thrive so they have the tools and they have the means to actually drive uh, the digital transformation uh, with this i think we have come to the end of our presentation so we would like to take some questions, although I cannot see any questions uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, I hope our participants are gathering their thoughts uh, to frame the questions. So meanwhile, uh, I'll just, uh, uh, I have some questions. So let me just ask uh, those questions. Uh, I'll begin with uh, the first speaker uh, from the regulator, Dr. Zoha. 
Uh, in your slide, I think you have uh, touched upon uh, building public trust and social acceptance, especially it uh, deals uh, how it deals with personal data. So I was wondering how uh, BTRC balance the need uh, for innovation, especially in the emerging technology and smart city initiatives and uh, the need to protect the citizens' uh, data and how you are ensuring privacy. Maybe if you can shed some lights on it. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Nidup. I think it's a uh, very relevant question even considering the uh, the scenario that we have uh, in this part of the world. And uh, though I think a lot of countries, they have been very much encouraged with GDPR uh, that was first adopted by European countries. Later on, it became a, uh, a very good standard document for many of the countries to look into the, uh, the legal aspect of using public data. And uh, definitely we did not have a uh, in, in a specific legal framework for that, especially for collecting and utilizing the public data. Uh, it The question came with the emergence of the e-commerce services. And as uh, Mr. Abdul Kayum uh, has directly mentioned in his intervention that it became more evident during the COVID pandemic uh, that how we are collecting the data, how, how those are in, 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 uh, utilized it's not only the data that the social networks they are using, but in addition to that, the traditional data that has been collected by the government agencies, like the uh, like the election commission, who have all the database of all the adult population, and the birth and uh, birth register and the marriage register authorities. So uh, that's why the government uh, have been working for last uh, almost for two years to develop a, a data protection law. Previously, it was addressed in, uh, in, in in isolated way. For example, in the election-related uh, law, they are addressing how to utilize the that, uh, data that is collected for that, for that particular purpose for the voter list. Uh, the, the law or the policy that is applicable to the uh, birth and marriage register, they were, that was regulated in a different way. But that was not a centralized platform. In addition to that, the data that is being generated in the digital platform. So there was not a comprehensive policy on that. It was uh, traditionally tasked lightly by the Telecommunication Act, but it, it was not actually uh, fulfilling the requirement that you rightly mentioned that to bring the trust of the people and to make sure that they are being protected. Even they are not aware about the possible threat or possible use case of the commercial use case of those data. So the draft is already, uh, the draft is there. I think the, there are some panels of the government who are reviewing it. And hopefully we can see a, a clear legal framework uh, based on that. In addition to that, we had also a, a, a separate act that is the Cyber Security Act. It also covered a part of the uh, data security and the uses. But if I compare it with the GDPR or similar type of legal framework, I think that is what we are lagging now. And hopefully, it will be addressed with the upcoming uh, Data Security Act. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zoha. Uh, well articulated. Um, uh, we have a question for Mr. Kayum. So if I may read it out, it says, what are the primary use cases of 5G in India, according to your opinion, what could be an ideal use case to introduce 5G in SC country, countries? Uh, sorry, Mr. Nidu, I couldn't actually hear it. Can you be uh, loud? Uh, the, question, the, the question says, what are the primary use cases of 5G in India? According to your opinion, what would be an ideal use case uh, introduced 5G in C countries? Uh, do you is the question visible on your laptop? I think they have put down on the question and answer box. No, I I, I could now. I'm not, although I'm not able to see very the question, but yes, I understood yes. Uh, that uh, the use cases of 5G in India, right? So. Uh, uh, Actually, 
the 5G that is available in India uh, supports mainly broadband, enhanced broadband, right? And still the operators have not enabled the other two pillars of 5G, right? So those two use cases uh, are not, uh, will not be coming up immediately till they uh, uh, make those two features available in their network. So as far as uh, 5G was mainly, if I say, was for the industry, 4.0 industry, right? Now, uh, there is a uh, problem. There are small use cases, that is, with respect to the factories or campuses, or, uh, you know, so in India, there is a, uh, there are people who are competent to provide or sell a solution, right? But we have not, so far, we have not been able to provide them spectrums directly. The spectrum to them is available through the sub service provider. And perhaps this is discouraging the development of 5G use cases for the industry. Industry, are not really very sure that if we go for a big operator, it is going to solve our problem. We, you know, if you see the quality of service that is available, I think we should think twice. If you are not having a Wi-Fi at your home or in your office, or if you are not having a uh, fixed line uh, broadband, it is really very challenging to ensure that machines will be running. I'm able to talk to you because this is on a fixed broadband. Had it been purely on uh, mobile, we may notice disturbances. So if you see from industry standpoint, they are not very comfortable to outsource this to any service provider for running their campuses, for running their machines. So this is, uh, this is what we find there is a disconnect unless this disconnect is solved by the service providers with the industry that are supposed to use 5G network. Uh, we find uh, a very little use of 5G for what it was meant. So it is like a 4G plus the users that we find currently is 4G plus. You have a better broadband speed. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Karyum. I think the message is clear. So we need to have a mix of 5G and I think fixed Wi-Fi. Uh, with this, uh, we have uh, another question, but I would like to uh, ask uh, Mr. Lee, uh, especially on ITU works. Uh, you mentioned about digital twins and city bursts. So I was uh, wondering how uh, ITUT study group 20's work uh, on these technologies will contribute to digital transformation of smart, sustainable cities. Okay, uh, basically uh, digital transformation is, uh, you know, applying digital technology in various vertical in the city. So you can uh, digitalize the every uh, city infrastructures. And based on that, you can collect uh, real-time data from the all of the city, and you can do uh, utilize that. For example, uh, using the data for the uh, policy making or uh, city planning or city operating or whatever. And in ITUT, there's uh, many digital twin related recommendations are uh, already developed or under development. So in basically in based uh for every you know many verticals. So. If you have any uh, verticals to be, you know, digitalized or transformed into the digital one, then you can uh, utilize that. So uh, there is a the many digital twin related recommendation already available or under development on various verticals. So you can utilize it, and also uh, we believe that the digital twin technology is the one of the key enabler for the city bus or metaverse. So basically, uh, city bus or metaverse has to, you know, uh, you know make a 
real-time model of city in the virtual world, and that virtual world model should be uh, synchronized with the real city. That means you need definitely you need IoT and digital twin technology to synchronize synchronize both you know physical things and virtual objects in in the virtual uh, spaces. So the basically in this way the digital twin or IoT and metaverse can help city to make a, a decision on the policy making before they uh, actually implementing everything on the city directly. You can do the simulations and everything, so you can uh, save your many costs and you can uh, build more effective policy or the planning, city planning. So that can help you, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, yes, as you mentioned, I think uh, digital twin and metaverse, this will serve as a very uh, tools that will help policy makers and decision makers to actually implement smart city initiatives. And uh, I think we understand how powerful this uh, two technologies can be, uh, especially when we try to implement and simulate the real world environment uh, to see uh, physically. So with this, uh, let us turn to the last speaker, uh, Mr. Ashish from GSMA. So Mr. Ashish, you have mentioned that uh, uh, you have touched upon the connectivity on mo um, mobile connectivity. So I want to know how uh, do you see the role of mobile operators actually in the evolving in the smart city ecosystem beyond uh, connectivity? So is it only the connectivity or is there any other emerging technologies that the mobile operator can actually help in building the smart city initiatives? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Nidhu, for asking this. And uh, uh, I tried to uh, actually uh, answer to uh, it through uh, in my slides, but uh, let me uh, provide a, uh, a little bit, uh, you know, detailed response to it. Uh, yes, operators are moving uh, beyond connectivity, just a connectivity provider to become a service providers and uh, uh, maybe an integrated solution provider to enable uh, smart cities and sustainable smart cities i would say uh, what are the benefits uh, you know if if uh, uh, the uh, agencies consider mobile operator for this role is first of all they can be a trusted partner you know they have already made huge investment and that can be leveraged by uh, the uh, agencies secondly operators can also very quickly uh, you know in a probably in a faster way they can respond to infrastructure related challenges or the infrastructure gaps uh, which uh, exist uh, uh, between the urban cities and the intermediary city uh, in uh, our region and uh, i would also like to emphasize on the role of mobile operators in providing affordability solutions right mobile operators are also offering platforms for mobile payments and also pay as you go model to increase affordability of low income households as i emphasize or brought out this point during my slides as well so the affordability solution is also there i think last but not the uh, least uh, i think uh, uh, mr zoha or um, uh, mr kayum mentioned about it the security you know data security so operators are already a licensee in uh, the telecom domain and uh, they uh, are bound by the uh, data security or the uh, you know various licensing provisions are there which ensures data privacy or security so uh, again uh, coming to a point of you know they can be a trusted partner so so they are already uh, fulfilling the in infrastructure related challenges uh, and the gaps, they are abiding by the data security related regulations and they can continue to do so uh, if they uh, are into the uh, providing smart city solution. They uh, not only connectivity, they are also or they can also be considered for providing uh, entire uh, end to end solutions. So these are some of the things which I think that which we and, and we at GSM believe that mobile operators can uh, take up uh, to uh, uh, ensure or to deliver uh, sustainable smart city solutions. Mm, thank you, Ashish. I think uh, that's why uh, the industry is one of the key pillar of uh, smart city ecosystem. Um, with this, I think we are almost coming to the end of our session. 
and uh, I, I hope our audience had uh, liked our discussion on this uh, topic. Uh, just uh, my thought at the end, uh, whether it's uh, forward-looking regulations or policies which is crafted by the regulators or the government or the global standards which is driven by the international organizations and also uh, whether it's cutting edge technologies, whether driven by the industry. I think uh, the basic we are at the pivotal moment, especially in the region uh, of South Asia where the quarter of the world population resides and especially because of the rapid urbanization, our city infrastructures are strained and it is exhausting. Uh, it's uh, because of that, I think it's crucial to think of smarter ways, not only to manage, uh, but also to address the challenges that come with it, such as uh, uh, the climate changes and traffic congestion, air pollution, and we should think of uh, doing it in a very sustainable way. Um, uh, the bottom line is, I think uh, there should be a commitment from all the industry, regulators, uh, governments, uh, and the international organization to work together to realizing this uh, uh, smart city initiatives and overall, I think it is also the one of the sustainable development goal of the United Nations SDG 11. Uh, with this comment, I think on behalf of APT and the Secretariat, I would like to thank our esteemed speakers and all the participants for your time and contributions. Uh, last but not the least, uh, I would like to thank the Secretary General, our Deputy Secretary General and Director for their constant support and guidance. And yes, not to forget a shout out, a big shout out to our team who have been working very hard from the past few months to put this event uh, together uh, successfully. And I think uh, we had a very good session and I hope our participants liked it. And uh, for your information, tomorrow is the World Cities Day. So I think we it uh, rightly timed our dialogue. So please take a moment to think of uh, making your cities uh, smarter and livable. Uh, with this, I would like to say thank you once again and have a good day and take care. Thank you, Nizam. Uh, thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. By the way, please provide your feedback. Uh, the link of feedback is in the chat box and for the participants. And uh, since today's dialogue was quite good, informative, um, the, I would like to report at the coming SATLC. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Yeah, thank you.